Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Our monthly leaders forum addresses vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plow. I'm the executive director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 National American Charitable Organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, the leading institution named in honor of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The hospital is a motto of coexistence as it serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center via our website and social media outlets on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube, and on our Facebook page and discussion group. Today's Global Connections topic is crime in America. Thank you to our very special guest, Ray Kelly, former New York City Police Commissioner and CEO of The Guardian Group. Richard Burke, Emeritus Professor of Criminology and Statistics at the University of Pennsylvania. Rosa Brooks, Professor of Law and Policy at Georgetown Law Center. And Chuck Wexler, Executive Director of the Police Executive Research Forum. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. Thank you, Josh. Any discussion of crime in America leads inevitably to some of our country's most profound problems, economic and social inequality, the loss of jobs and the breakdown of institutions in poor urban neighborhoods, easy access to guns. The recent uptick in violent crime leads to discussion of some more recent problems, the COVID pandemic, the widely viewed incidents of police violence against Blacks that prompted calls to defund the police and led to the movement Black Lives Matter, and the demoralization of police forces. Our discussion may touch on many or all of those factors, but our main focus is on how law enforcement, uh, what law enforcement can or should do in the face of worsening crime numbers over the past couple of years. Our first panelist, Professor Richard Burke, who has been studying crime and crime statistics for many years. His involvement in this field goes back to working as a young staffer for the Kerner Commission, which studied the urban riots of the 1960s and famously warned in its 1968 report that our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Richard Burke is Professor Emeritus of Criminology and Statistics at the University of Pennsylvania, and also a Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Statistics at UCLA. Richard Burke, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. And I want to start uh, with you so we can get a fix on just how bad the rise in violent crime over the past few years has been, or can we answer that question with confidence? It's very hard to answer because it's become so politicized. And there's so many different ways of answering your question that I can't give one simple conclusion with a great deal of confidence. But it looks like homicides have increased across the country four or 5%, whereas armed robbery, which is also a violent crime, has decreased about 10%. So there's not one answer. And then it also depends, of course, on where you live because crime like politics is local. What state do you live in, what neighborhood do you live in in those cities are really the determining factors or whether crime is going up or down. You, you addressed the question of uh, whether crime is increasing and why in a piece online earlier this year, and you, you considered some of the most common explanations that have, that have been offered. Uh, uh, some of them have to do with COVID, and, and you conclude that uh, even if, if COVID may have disrupted uh, social life uh, for much of America, the, the timing doesn't quite fit as an explanation for a rise in, in crime. Yeah, um, in many jurisdictions, some of the ones with the most serious crime problems, the uptick in homicide and violent crime actually began about a year before. 
And there were some ups and downs and then a, a great increase, supposedly, uh, around 2020. Um, so COVID isn't going to tell a whole story. It certainly contributed something to the story, but it's not all that's going on. Uh, another cause often cited is less aggressive uh, police practices in response to criticism from Black Lives Matter and other groups, uh, criticism of, of the police use of force. Does that time fit uh, uh, the explanation? That time fits better, um, but there's very little hard data on changes in police practices. I talk to a lot of law enforcement folks and they make that claim. And I talk to folks in the community and they say, well, we now in this city, let's say Philadelphia, have a get out of jail free card so we can do what we want to do. But it's mostly anecdotal. Um, the research really still needs to be done. Uh, one point that you made to me when we spoke uh, uh, earlier is that there really is no meaningful national crime rate. And you're speaking to us from Philadelphia. There really isn't a, a Pennsylvania crime rate to talk about or even a citywide Philadelphia. This is a very localized neighborhood by neighborhood phenomenon. Absolutely. I mean, I live in an area of Philadelphia. We've had one homicide in all the time I've been here. And just a mile away in Germantown, which is also part of Philadelphia, we can get four and five homicides on a weekend. Very small difference geographically, enormous difference in the amount of crime. I, I have a question about the uh, the relationship between violent crime, and as, as is sometimes suggested, uh, and uh, uh, police behavior, whether the police are being less aggressive. Uh, and I, I can understand how the gang that descends on a San Francisco department store smashes the windows, grabs all of the goods on display and makes off. How they they know, I, I, I assume, that the district attorney of the day isn't interested in property crimes. He's made it, he's, he's made it public. But to two 19 year olds with a gun and a beef, uh, or a, a couple whose domestic uh, uh, argument has gone from screaming to hitting to, to worse, is violent crime based on a calculation of what will what will happen to you, uh, what what the police will do? It seems like it's it's more impulsive matter than that. Well, there are several different uh, streams of thought on that. Economists like to play the rational choice game, as you describe, calculate the costs and benefits of some particular action, and then make your decision. But I think everybody in, who studies crime appreciates just what you said. But a lot of this is very impulsive. Kid doesn't go out on the street normally looking to kill somebody, but gets into a beef, pulls his gun and shoots. Maybe he hits the person, maybe he doesn't. Um, but it's not something that's been planned for weeks and weeks. That's quite different, it seems, from mass shootings, which get a lot of the publicity, yeah. where there seems to be more forethought involved. In uh, discussing the increase in homicides, according to uh, FBI data through 2020, uh, the, the greatest share of the increase of victims by far uh, and offenders was among African-Americans. And according to FBI numbers, uh, African-Americans now account for the number I saw was 54% of homicide victims. That's supposed to being about 12, I think 13% of the population. Yes. Uh, do those numbers surprise you? Not at all. Um... Here in Philadelphia, I keep coming back to Philadelphia because I know the scene pretty well. We've had about uh, 500 or so homicides so far this year. The vast majority of perpetrators are young black men. The vast majority of victims are also black and very commonly young black men. Young black men have the highest rate of death from homicide compared to any other age or ethnic cohort. So uh, the the, uh, the the community which has the most problematic relationship with the police uh, also has the the most the, the greatest need of the police. Let's put it that way. They they're s s suffering from from crime. Well, problematic needs to be qualified. I think if, you, if there's been lots of survey research going back to the Kerner Commission, asking people in disadvantaged communities, do you want to see more police, less police, and so on. And overwhelmingly, the majority says, we want more policing. We want better policing, but we want more policing. Now, there are certainly spokespersons, often self-appointed from those communities, who claim the opposite. But by and large, the common folks in those communities want to see more police, not less. Uh, 
let's let's stipulate that the Kerner Commission, uh, which was very controversial 50 years ago, yeah. uh, uh, let, let's say that they had it right about uh, racism in America, creating black ghettos uh, where the supply of unskilled industrial jobs was diminishing, as was the morale of the people who lived in that neighborhood. That's been going on for a long time. It's a, it's a very old story. We've, we've, yes. we've been hollowing out industrial centers for, for many years now. Given all that, why do crime rates rise and fall? What, as, a, as a, someone who knows statistics, is it uh, demographics? Is it, uh, we talked about police tactics. Is it a new drug that, that hits the area? What, what makes crime go up in one decade or go down? Well, there's long-term and short-term trends. A very important long-term trend is the transition in the 1980s to Saturday night specials to Glock nine millimeter semi-automatic handguns, which now are easily obtained throughout uh, urban areas. And those are extremely lethal weapons, much more so than the pop shooters of 25 or 30 years ago. That's a long-term trend, which increases homicides. In addition to that, there's short-term events. For example, again, in Philadelphia, a particular community is um, encroached by drug trafficking on a particular street corner. Nothing very much happens. More drugs are brought in. There's a lot of drug transactions. Then there are drug deals gone bad. There are, there are fights over who controls the, mar the market. And that can lead to a short-term spike in a very small area of several square blocks. And those things are very hard to predict. They're situational. And they nevertheless bounce the crime rates up and down pretty dramatically in small areas. Again, in small areas. Uh, yes. And um, uh, when you think of an, of an area, with, uh, a high crime area, that needn't be a couple of square miles. It could be a lot smaller than that. A you know? couple of square blocks. Yep, that's okay. right. A couple of square blocks. Well, Professor Burke, Thank you, and stick around uh, for the Q&A session that we'll have later. Uh, that's uh, uh, Professor Richard Burke from Penn. Uh, you too, by the way, can take part in the question and answer session uh, by submitting questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your of your screen. Uh, we'll get to the to the Q&A after we've we've heard from all four of our panelists. Uh, our next panelist, Ray Kelly. Uh, has dealt with crime just about as much as anyone has. He was police commissioner of New York City for 14 years. That's more than anyone else. Uh, and uniquely among commissioners of the NYPD, he served two separate terms, uh, once in the early 90s uh, under Mayor David Dinkins, and then a longer term under Mayor Michael Bloomberg starting in 2002. Uh, he led the NYPD when crime rates were driven down by 40%, uh, for which he's widely credited. Uh, we should note, though, that he, both he and Mayor Bloomberg were also criticized uh, for the program commonly known as Stop and Frisk. Uh, Ray Kelly came up through the ranks of the New York police over more than 40 years uh, in the country's biggest police department. He managed to get two law degrees, a master's from the Kennedy School at Harvard. He did a combat tour as a Marine in Vietnam. He served in 25 different NYPD commands before becoming police commissioner, and he's currently CEO of the Guardian Group, which does security consulting. I could mention the commendations and awards Ray Kelly has received, but we only have an hour. Uh, so, Ray <laughs> Kelly, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Great to be with you, Robert. First, uh, why do you think crime has risen recently, violent crime? And if so, what would you do about it? I think there are several reasons why crime has gone up, but for me, the most significant reason is the backing off by police officers from proactive tactics and strategies that have been used in the past and have reduced crime to uh, sort of a transformation to being reactive and largely only uh, only reactive. And you know, the question is why did that happen? And you mentioned it before. The you know death of uh, George Floyd uh, brought about besides the 300 or something riots that uh, it, it took place, it brought about an avalanche of restrictions, legislation, rules, regulations directed at monitoring and stopping uh, actions from, by the police that uh, obviously the community uh, it doesn't uh, doesn't like. So. Um, it has also brought about, of course, the, the, the sort of exodus that we've seen from uh, police departments uh, throughout the country. 
And we've seen uh, just an article in the uh, Times on Friday uh, talking about it. But the, that article says that basically it's an issue of money. Yes. That's why police are leaving. And that's well, simply not the case. I believe it you is don't the, have 90. Yeah, it's the president of the PBA of the Policeman's Union who said exactly if they pay market <laughs> rates. They could keep them. That's what the competition is doing. Yes, that was his. You're absolutely his analysis. right. He, he, he used so very well. Uh, for that. that, that the, the thrust of the article is that they need more money. I think they do, but uh, it, you know, the money in NYPD is not too bad. You get a lot of overtime, there's a lot of benefits, unlimited sick leave, that, that sort of thing. So I don't think it's money. <clears throat> I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that cops are fed up, they're disgruntled, they've been, they've been demonized, they've been blamed for uh, just about everything under the sun. And uh, they're voting with their feet. They're leaving in big numbers. Certainly those numbers have never been seen in the NYPD before, but this is a national problem. It's, it's all over uh, the country. Yeah. And I, uh, I suppose yeah, we should just add the prov one proviso that, that th this is also a part of the great resignation, as they say, that, that the, the yeah. COVID pandemic has led to a lot of people leaving a lots, lots of kinds of jobs. It, uh, it, it gave a lot True. of people occasion to rethink what they're doing with their lives. Yeah, and people talk about Generation Z as, yeah. as being unique in that, uh, in that regard. But the fact is that uh, they're leaving in big numbers and replacing them is a major challenge. Yeah. And again, throughout the, throughout the country, certainly in, in New York. And uh, you know, it always brings up when you talk about recruiting and the difficulty in recruiting, uh, you have to think about standards. And will the standards remain high or as high as they should be uh, in an effort to uh, bring more people on board. In New York City, they're only about to replace uh, two thirds of the, the people that have, uh, have left. And they have real challenges because the city council uh, requires now that all police officers, new police officers live in New York City. And as we know, New York is without a doubt one of the most expensive cities in the yeah certainly in the country to, to live. So they have a lot of challenges in, in filling their, their ranks. I've, 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 um, I've heard it said, you believe that the job that police face now is just, it's impossible to do it. Uh, uh, I, uh, run through uh, 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 what might be an, an example of, of the kind of, uh, of uh, a reactive uh, stance that a, that a, police might take today with regard to crime that would would not have been what they did before uh and and let's leave well, i'll leave um stop and frisk out of it just just what they would have done over the past uh say say five eight years well, ago. well it, it's important to note that everybody certainly everybody on patrol is wearing a camera so yeah. their interactions are filmed now what i'm told is that it's not unusual for a uh, police officer to respond to an assignment and be cursed out totally. They go right up to them, talking to their, their, their face from inches away. And this is recurs all the time, recurs all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, that is a scenario that goes on day after day, uh, apparently. And, and one of the, the reactions to that is that police hold back. They uh, perhaps respond uh, a little bit slower than uh, than they would have, let's say, a few years ago. Uh, they're they're looking to, in a general way, lessen their engagement with the, with the public, and that's uh, obviously problematic. It's not something uh, <laughs> that I would recommend, but it's something that's happening. And do you think the absence of a, of a of a positive relationship with the public? Does what it 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 makes people uh, more likely to to proceed with criminal plans that they wouldn't otherwise have done, or how how does that lead to to increased uh, uh, crime? Well, I I think there's a theory certainly that uh, the more communication between uh, police officers and the community, the more information you'll receive, the better informed you are the better you're able to fight crime in a in particular neighborhood. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just a uh, common sense that you want to have a 
a strong relationship with the uh, with the communities that you you serve. Uh, and I would submit that uh, up until just a few years ago, the relationship between the communities of color and the police, certainly in New York, were uh, certainly looked better than they were, were better than they are now. Qualified immunity uh, that uh, that police enjoy is is it is it an important uh, principle to maintain, or should uh, one of the outcomes of the George Floyd and Ferguson and all of those highly publicized events be uh, more uh, more accountability on, on the part of the police officer? Yeah, qualified immunity is a defense that can be used by any civil servant. Mm -hmm. So what has happened is uh, city council, for instance, here and legislatures throughout the country have uh, restricted that defense from being used when police officers are, are on, on trial. So it's sort of eminently unfair in, in, in my mind, but it is a major sticking point. And it's sort of a mantra that the, that's sort of used in the locker rooms to emphasize that uh, they could lose their, their home or their house uh, their, their, their family could be impacted. Uh, so qualified immunity is a big issue. And by the way, that's why there is no national uh, the George Floyd bill. There was a lot of negotiation on it. Uh, you know, Senator Scott, South Carolina was involved in it. But the sticking point with the police organizations was the elimination of qualified immunity. So it, it, it's an important issue. And I personally think it, it should be uh, re, uh, reinstituted in the places where uh, it's been eliminated. You think that it that it it, it should be reinstituted? I mean, I do. As you say, this covers all civil servants. It's, it, it isn't unique to um, uh, uh, to police. On the other hand, the the police, unlike most civil servants, are are. Uh, uh, well, they're sent out with uh, to, to use violence on our behalf, on on behalf of citizens. Uh, uh, why shouldn't there be? Well, some... I mean, they potentially. Well, potentially, I don't mean I don't, we, don't, we don't send them out, sent to, break out to use violence. No, excuse me, exactly. <laughs> but but they're entitled to use violence on behalf of our good, and that's different from from uh, accountants and and uh, public school teachers and and um, why not a different uh, a different regime or is it simply something that would undermine morale still further among the police. Well, I think, I think it would undermine morale, but that's here in New York, you have the, uh, a great deal of oversight. We have two U.S. attorneys here. Both of them have a special public corruption uh, units. We have five district attorneys. They have uh, public corruption uh, uh, units. We have Internal Affairs Division that has about 500 uh, members in that uh, organization. We have a committee to uh, combat police corruption made up of civilians. We have a civilian complaint review board that's been given a lot of power uh, under this administration, the de Blasio uh, administration. Doesn't mean that things can't go wrong, but certainly the structure is there, in my opinion, to address it. Well, Commissioner Kelly, stick with us, because in, in a few minutes we'll have a question and answer session, and I, I want you to to be there for that. But thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Rosa Brooks. Uh, she's a professor of law and policy at Georgetown University, where among other things, she's also faculty director of the Center for Innovations and Community Safety. Uh, the center is an outgrowth of Professor Brooks' very unusual uh, act of adult education. She was a Georgetown professor after graduating Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard and being a Marshall Scholar at Oxford and Yale Law School, uh, and to the astonishment of friends and family, she, while on the Georgia faculty, qualified as a reserve police officer in Washington, D.C., served for five years and got a, a close-up look at questions that, um, uh, well, that she was indirectly teaching students about. Uh, she wrote a terrific book about that experience, by the way, called Tangled in Blue, Policing the American City. Rosie Brooks, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Robert. First, thinking back on your days and nights keeping the peace in Washington, D.C.'s uh, poorest, most uh, crime-ridden uh, district, if violence is up, violent crime is up, uh, what should the police do more of or do less of? You know, I'm not actually sure that police have a whole lot to do with it, right? I think that the 
most fundamental drivers of changes in the crime rate tend to be really long term. Mm -hmm. I think that we often have this fantasy that, uh oh, violent crime is up. It must be the police's fault. They need to do something different or we need more of them. Uh, when in fact the drivers, many of them are out of the control of the police, that they're, they're, they're just, they have to do with much deeper, longer term things like economic trends, like access to healthcare and education, you name it. That doesn't mean that there is no role for police, but I do think that we, we attribute much more influence, uh, on crime rates to the police than they, than they really have. Um, and this is part of the debate about, about, uh, whether we over rely on policing to solve social problems yeah. that, that probably have other roots. Um, so I, 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 I'm going to push back a little bit on the question. Okay. Uh, you, you came away from your experience uh, saying or writing that the police uh, are asked to do uh, uh, the, the job they're asked to do is, is impossible. Uh, how did you experience that as a reserve officer? What, what was the, what was the <laughs> burden? Know, I think I went into reserve policing thinking, how hard can this be? You know, that these 20 year olds with community college degrees can do this. And I'm smart. I'm a, I'm a law professor. I'm sure I'll be good at this. And what I it was an extraordinarily humbling experience because, uh, you know, as as I think Ray and others who have experienced law enforcement can attest, it is so hard. It is so hard to even be a mediocre cop, much less be a really good cop. And part of that is precisely because we having essentially underfunded so many social services in this country for so long, increasingly in a lot of very poor communities, police police officers are the only representatives of the state or the city people ever see, which means that they get expected to be the first responders, not only to situations involving crime, but also to situations that involve homeless, that involve mental illness, that involve you know family disputes that have not reached the threshold of crime and probably won't. Uh, and we're really asking them to go in the course of a single shift from being social workers to being teachers and mentors to taking sick people to the hospital or doing CPR on somebody who's overdosed uh, to responding to homicide scenes. And, and you know, any one of those jobs, social worker, teacher, et cetera, is really, really hard to do well. Mm -hmm. And asking a police officer to do all of them well, it's just not possible for anyone. Well, I mean, should should the police be... be uh... Uh, spared some of those duties uh, and have more social workers uh, out, out out in the field, or, or or more school officials out in the field. Yeah, you know, this is another one of those issues where I think there's a short term challenge and a long term challenge, and and they're different. You know, I, I I'm not a fan of that defund the police slogan. I do think that America's cities and states should be putting more funding into those non policing. Uh, avenues. Um, but I think that it's not just an issue of take money from the police, give it to other agencies, and everything will be fine, because that's going to take a really long time, right? If you send a bunch of social workers in right now, first of all, we just, most cities don't have the trained cadre of social workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you want to talk about things like education or housing or healthcare. Many city departments uh, that focus on behavioral health or housing themselves have all kinds of problems. You know, if you just swap out police officers for others, you know, you may just simply be switching the problem to a different place. Yeah. You know, in the longer term, you know, I think if you say, well, gee, what do we want public safety to look like in 20 years, 30 years? You know, who do we want to be doing it? Do we want to have different kinds of social workers, different kinds of behavioral health people, different kinds of teachers? We're going to have to make some real investments in recruiting those people, training those people, paying those people. And we're not going to be able to do that tomorrow. So, so I think I think defund the police in the short term tends to be pretty disastrous. Mm -hmm. but thinking in the long term about how we'd want to invest differently and allocate investments differently, uh, I think that's actually a really important conversation to be having. Right. But but as 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 I think you would you would you would say uh, as well to learn that a city has an overburdened child protective services department that uh, isn't uh, meeting its standards and uh, doesn't have enough people is it wouldn't it, it, there's nothing surprising to learn that uh, about a city these days and yeah no and it's uh, something I often talk to my my law students about because a lot of them want to defund the police and I say well okay if it's not the police then who and they tend to say things like well child and family services and I say okay. You want to tell me what their record looks like in addressing issues? Not so great. So, in 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 the face of a of a rising rate of violent crime, let's say in in the part of of uh, of Washington that you used to patrol, uh, 
does it make sense to say there should be more people patrolling? They should send more police uh, in, in, into the area? No, I, I, I think that's like the budget question. The issue isn't more money or less money. It's often how spending differently. And I think the same is true with numbers of police. It's not more, more cops, fewer cops. It's what are they actually doing? You know, that you can have more cops doing stupid things and it won't have any impact on crime. You can have fewer cops doing smarter things. It may have a greater impact. I think one of the, the challenges in talking about policing is that it's it's sort of hyper local. Uh, there are 18,000 different law enforcement organizations in the United States, and they they operate quite differently. The only thing they have in common is the, the sort of rather low floor set by the U.S. Constitution. Um, but in many other ways, they operate totally differently. So in some communities, you have police who are encouraged by their department to spend a lot of time focusing on getting to know people in the community, on intelligence gathering, et cetera. In other places, you have cops who are sitting in static posts, not doing much of anything, and there are no internal police department mechanisms for getting information from the patrol officer up to the leadership. So, so I think you, you have to sort of think of it somewhat differently and think of it, well, what do we know about the kind of policing that is more likely to be effective in very high crime communities? And that may or may not map on to more or fewer, but it has mostly has to do with, with different. You you uh, write about uh, your training in some detail. Uh, and uh, uh, one thing you remark is that despite the training, uh, you it was unclear what it means to say the police are doing a very good job. That, <laughs> that, that uh, Did that mean they're making a lot of arrests? Well, uh, you can make a lot of arrests because people aren't uh, signaling when they change lanes in their in in their cars. Uh, 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 does it mean that uh, the that crime rates go down? That may be beyond the control. What, uh, how, I, having wrestled with that idea for for a couple of years now, or a few years, uh, what do you come away thinking? What what is the me the measure of the police doing a good job? Yeah, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, I think I think ultimately the measure of whether the police are doing a good job is whether a significant percentage of the community feels that they're doing a good job and different communities have different needs. Um, I, I the thing that did strike me really in the in the training was certainly at the police academy in DC, we we never talked about any of those questions. So we never really had a chance to sort of flesh out, well, gee, what is what does good policing mean to you? What does it mean to the chief? What does it mean to your lieutenant? What does it mean to you know the minister at that church over there? What does it mean to the teachers? And, and those conversations, like you know, here again, I think the answer is going to be different in different places. But if you're not even having them, then you end up falling back on these, you know, okay, let's have more money or less money or more cops or fewer cops. Rather than saying in a very in a very specific granular way, hey, here's this neighborhood. Here's what's going on in this neighborhood. Let's talk to people. Let's find out what they perceive as problems and what they perceive as solutions. Because it may turn out that what they perceive as problems are quite different than the things that the mayor perceives as problems or the chief perceives as problems. Well, Rosie Brooks, thank you very much for being here today, and uh, stick around because I'll come back to all of you in uh, in just a few moments. Uh, for decades, our next guest, uh, Chuck Wexler, has been a great source of information on what's happening in police work around the country. Uh, back in the 1970s, he was an MIT grad student and an intern with the Boston police, whom he saw keeping the peace uh, during the turbulent desegregation of the Boston public schools. He says <laughs> that was the role that attracted him to working uh, on police issues. Since the early 90s, Wexler has been executive director of the Police Executive Research Forum. It's a Washington-based think tank whose mission is to encourage professionalism uh, in policing. Chuck, thanks for joining us. Good talk with you. Nice to hear you again, Robert. Okay. Um, I, I want to start with, with the factor that we've, we've talked a little bit about, but not much, and that is guns. Uh, how important uh, are, are guns as a contributing factor to, to violent crime and its rise? Well, I think um, I think it is probably if you were doing if Professor Burke was doing a regression analysis and he put guns in, uh, you would see it is uh, was statistically very significant. You know, the FBI has the National Incident Instant Criminal Background Check (NICS), and what they do is they look at every year how many people check. For guns. In other words, if you want to purchase a gun, this check has to be done. And if you look in the years from, say, uh, 1999, when it was like 9 million a year, 
And then you go down to say 2009, it's 14 million. You know, it's gradual increases, 20 million in 2014. So in the year 2019, right before the pandemic, we had 28 million checks. The next year in 2020, when the pandemic hit, you had 39 million, 10 million more guns on the street. So 2020, according to the ATF, you had 40 million people bought guns, many of them first time buyers. So however you look at this issue, the issue of the, the proliferation of guns in that year, 2020, had an enormous impact. And if you listen to what Professor Burke said, two crimes in particular, shootings and homicides. If you look at all of the index crimes, those two crimes were the ones that statistically went up. So more guns on the street had a significant impact. Uh, And and as uh, Professor Burke has written, uh, I believe, uh, shootings and homicides they, it's a battle between great advances in surgery and advances in the power, the lethality of the weapons, uh, that um, uh, the number of, of homicides uh, may go up as a share of shootings, uh, but the number of shootings could remain the same simply because the guns are more, or right. are, are that much more lethal. Right, and you had, you know, you had, you had this phenomenal ghost guns. And people are saying, well, what are ghost guns? Well, ghost guns are these, guns that you can actually put together and the ATF doesn't regulate them. So there's no serial number. So that came into the mix. I think, you you know, the, the discussion is sort of trying to understand what, what has happened during, say, 2020, 21, why we saw a significant increase in crime. And, and in many ways, it's a combination of factors. You had the pandemic. You had, you know, 10 million more guns on the street. You had a criminal justice system that came to a close. I mean, Commissioner Kelly would be the first to, to, to say you did not have a trial in yes. the city of New York City during the pandemic. So, you you know, you, you had people locked in. Domestic violence went up. This was an unusual period in America. People were on edge. More guns were being carried on the street. A combustible mixture. Of course, the strange thing about guns as a political issue is that uh, one one reason for rises in gun sales is that uh, people proposing gun control or what they'll call common sense gun laws uh, running for office win. Uh, and uh, a- after elections like that, people become convinced that somebody's going to come and uh, prevent them from ever getting a gun. So, so yeah. sales spike before before the people who are going to take your gun away get into office. So the the, uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the ATF would tell you that when Democrats get elected, yeah. uh, you know, more people will buy guns because yeah. they're fearful that somehow, you know, sweeping gun legislation is going to happen. You know, whenever there's talk about an assault weapons ban, assault weapons go way up. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I would not put it all about guns because I don't think it is all about guns. I think it's a criminal justice system that came to hold. I mean, and carjackings in particular in Chicago and Minneapolis and Philadelphia and Washington among really young kids. And why? I mean, I talked to a Chicago uh, head of detectives and he says, you know, you would have someone carjack a car in Chicago maybe two or three times a week and they weren't holding them because they were juveniles. Mm -hmm. You had people who were not in school during this period. So you had younger people committing crimes and not being held. I don't think I would take a little bit of an issue with Commissioner Kelly uh, on the fact that the police own this whole issue of, you know, why crime went up. I think, you know, there there was some role. I, w- I won't disagree, but I think you can't put it all on the police. I think this was an unusual period in America and around the world. But in America in particular, I think you had this 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 very unusual and people, the, the level of anger that people had. And people just weren't being held in, in, in jail or being tried. On, on, on the question of, of police morale and uh, public attitudes toward police, when, when, when we spoke uh, last week, you pointed to a verdict you were stunned by in the George Floyd case. And it wasn't the conviction of Derek Chauvin, the, the man who killed him, 
uh, it was the conviction of the newbie police officer who didn't stop uh, Chauvin from 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 killing him, uh, even though that was his his superior officer. Uh, Thirty six months in prison. Um, what did that uh, conviction and sentencing say to you? Well, first of all, let's be really clear. Uh, this was a homicide. Yeah. Uh, Chauvin was responsible. Um, you know, the the could those other officers have done something? Yes, the answer is yes. But I think part of this issue, quite frankly, is Chauvin is a 20-year veteran. He's an FTO field training officer. These were rookie cops um, who, in some cases, were actually telling Chauvin, shouldn't we turn him over? We're concerned about excited delirium. So let's be really clear here. This was this this what Chauvin did was was a homicide, was a murder. But you know, when you see, I think when other officers see what uh, happened to additional officers, I mean, it's only now that we're training officers on how to intervene in situations like that, and that's really important, or how to de-escalate situations like that. We had a meeting here in Washington a couple of weeks ago. We had 250 people here, and it was on some of the issues uh, Commissioner Kelly was talking about, the difficulty of hiring and recruiting the next generation of cops. And, and you know, one of the one of the issues, uh, one of the chiefs said, is the, the, the concern that, that officers might have about becoming, you know, involved in a situation like this where they didn't act, what would happen to them? I think what you're seeing in this country is, you know, a new standard of what's expected of officers in these situations. Mm -hmm. And for the good cop to be put with, with a cop that might involve themselves in an action like this, they now have to think, what will I do? What are the consequences of not acting? What are the consequences of acting? I'm not sure the, the police culture is ready for this. So what you're seeing is, you know, police chiefs are asking themselves, who are going to be the next generation of cops? You know, it's not going to be about money. And, and I agree with, with Commissioner Kelly about that. It isn't about money. It is about, you know, it is about serving it about, you know. And I guess one other other issue I take uh, issue with, with my good friend Rosa Brooks is, you know, people say the police are being asked to do too much. And in my mind, I think the police should be paid as well as better than any public servant, because at three o'clock in the morning, you know, when a homeless person is overdosing and a cop has Narcan, or when there's someone who has mental health issues and is walking down the street, you know, and with no clothes on, you know, we need people in society that you can call a number and someone comes to their rescue. To me, that's what a civilized society is, this idea that someone else should be doing all of these things. I'm okay with training the police well, paying them well, and having them be the ones that step up and deliver services. You know, 80% of what the police do is services. It's not about crime. Your uh, think tank uh, is all about helping police departments to professionalize and to improve. Uh, I'm just I wondering if you can give us a, a success story. That is, uh, if you wanted to point to a police department somewhere in the country and say, look, what happened there was it was well enough done that it withstood the general increase in violent crime around the country. You take... You know, you take Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey had been written off one of the five most violent cities in the country. Numerous police chiefs coming in to try to change it. And you had, you know, you had someone bright, smart from within the department. The, the conventional thinking is, you know, you need outside people to fix things. That's not always the case. Came in, basically recognized that the culture they had didn't work, created a new culture, taught ICAT de-escalation training, but also got them, got the community engaged rather than, you know, more enforcement. It was more about how do we get the, you know, the community is going to have more to do with public safety than cops. A cop's important. Yeah. Do you have to get that really violent person off the street? Absolutely. Because that person is committing more to the crimes, but it's about the culture. It's about developing the legitimacy mm -hmm. you you need with the community. Why? Because the community is going to tell you, you know, that kid over there, he has a gun, he's going to go shoot someone. And so you can get that kid before he shoots someone. So it can be done. It was done there. It can be done in other places. Well, Chuck Wexler of the uh, Police Executive Research Forum. Thanks. Stay right there. I'd like to bring back uh, Rosie Brooks, Ray Kelly, and Richard Burke uh, all together. And uh, uh, 
well, let's uh, start first with Richard uh, uh, Burke. Uh, from what you've heard from your three fellow panelists, any any thoughts, comments, questions? Uh, just a comment. Uh, I thought everybody made some really telling points, and I think there's a possibility of some integration across them. And just very briefly, um, there's long-term strategies and short-term strategies. While we wait for the long-term to do good, assuming we know how, thinking back to the war and poverty, it's not clear we know how, but let's say we do. People are gonna die. 500 people are gonna die in Philadelphia each year over the next four or five years while we wait for longer term solutions. So we need, unfortunately, to be more aggressive in some of our policing more. I like the word proactive. I think that's right. We should be preventing crime. We need to be more proactive in a surgical way. We know how to do that too. Same thing with incarceration. We need to do that in a surgical way, while at the same time looking ahead to probably decades long changes, which can help make things better. These are not mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. even though unfortunately they're sometimes posed as opposites. Commissioner Kelly, uh, there were uh, uh, some comments from Chuck Wexler about about your remarks, and what 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 do you what did you hear from your from your fellow panelists? I just like to address the issue of social workers replacing mm -hmm. the police because uh, during my time as a uniform person, at least we had three, minimum of three pilot projects to try that. And the reality is that those social workers want the police to be with them. These are dangerous situations. The, you know, people can uh, certainly uh, act out. You need police enforcement and security capability uh, with them. In NYPD, there's a emergency service unit. And the city and New York has about 125,000 calls a year for emotionally disturbed people. Most of those calls are handled by the emergency service unit who and police officers, but the emergency medical technicians, the emergency psychological technicians, and they do an outstanding job. I used to be in that unit many years ago. So I guess what I'm saying is you can train police officers to do uh, a lot of uh, work that social workers can do, but they also have the ability to protect themselves and to take some really <laughs> unruly people into uh, into custody. The other thing I would like to say is uh, I don't think we've sufficiently flushed out the reason why police officers are leaving in great numbers. I know Chuck in, the, in Perth did a study about the numbers of police officers leaving, and you know it's it's significant. But there has been no study that I'm aware of that says why that sat cops down and whatever we want to call it focus groups or whatever works find out precisely why are they leaving. Uh, the, you know, executives, police executives, they want to say it's money because otherwise it reflects on them to a certain extent. So we haven't gotten, I think, in my mind, a sufficient answer as to why we see the tremendous the flow of cops out of the profession. And I, I completely agree with you, Chuck. Right now, often you, we, we, we need to have people who respond. And right now, the cops are usually the only people there, right? You know, that we don't have this magical group of social workers with the right skills who are going to, you know, fly out to every every scene. Um, you know, even, even leaving aside the question of whether some of those scenes are going to require somebody who's armed. And some of them do. Not all of them do. You know, and some municipalities have experimented pretty successfully with a sort of triaging 911 calls so that you can send mental health crisis response units to places where there are no indicators that there will be physical danger. Um, but even so, sometimes you can't tell, you know, and we want to err on the side of safety for the responders. Um, I do think police should be paid more right now because I do think one of the drivers that that pushes people out, uh, not only is it low pay, it's 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 low pay, but it's also I think the internal rigidity of a lot of police departments. I'm not sure many people outside of policing appreciate the fact that it can be extraordinarily difficult to advance rapidly within a police department. It can be quite difficult in some departments to come in laterally from a different department and come in at a senior level rather than having to start all over again. It can be quite difficult for 
people to go out and then come back in without losing a lot of ground. And especially as we shift to a generation that expects that they're not necessarily going to stay in the same job for 20 years, that doesn't think, oh, I've just got to work my way up, you know, and, and say yes, sir, yes, sir, until I'm one of the bosses, and then I can have people say yes, sir, to me. You know, we increasingly have a generation in DC, for instance, the 75% of the recruits have four-year college degrees. You know, and they expect to be taken seriously as people by their department as well. And often the department isn't structured to do that. So I think we need to be much more creative in terms of how we structure policing as an occupation city by city and making sure that police organizations are learning organizations that they can use the people they've got effectively. And that's part of what will help people stay. And the only the other only other thing I would add, uh, just uh, hopefully Ray Kelly, maybe this will make you feel better. Um, my experiences in, in DC, I actually only once or twice got people who cursed and spat. And a lot of the time, you know, even in, in very poor high crime neighborhoods, my partners and I would have people say, thank you for coming. We appreciate what you're doing. And, and I think that goes back to something that you said very early on, when you actually poll people in very high crime neighborhoods, by and large, they're not saying, you know, some of them are saying we don't want these cops here, but by and large, most of them are saying we, we want police here. We want them to be treating us with respect and listening to us, but we don't want fewer. We want, we want more. Uh, it's a little bit like, you know, do you, do you approve of Congress? We hate Congress. Do you like your congressman? Oh yeah, he's okay. Uh, so by and large, yeah. I actually think people are less anti-police than we sometimes assume. Well, you wearing your camera. Yep. Did you, did you work when the Cameras were being worn by police officers. Yep. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was that was one one bit of the thirty pounds of equipment that you that you, <laughs> yeah. that you carried around. Yeah. And, and, um, Ch Chuck Wexler, thoughts on on what you've heard from uh, from your fellow panelists? I just think that uh, it's an interesting period we've gone through the last uh, two to three years. I mean, the pandemic has just I mean, like we're living a hundred years from the nineteen eighteen, you know. Uh, pandemic, we thought that would never happen, and 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 it did, and 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 what happened then, and and how crime played a factor. I mean, it's we I, we do police chiefs uh, do worry about who's going to be the next generation of cops, who's going to want this job. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the whole issue of body body worn cameras. We wrote the guidelines for the Justice Department, and how that has shown the American people. Uh, a, a side of policing that honestly uh, they had never seen. And so now in terms of use of force and you watch TV and you see that, you know, the next video is, is hard to watch and then they show it. And, and somehow that has framed people's images of the police. But here's what hasn't happened. I mean, there was the defund movement a couple of years ago. I mean, when the George Floyd murder happened, what didn't happen is people one talked about, we need to reform the police. That happened back in Ferguson and during that, that period. But in this period, it was, we have to defund the police. But look what happened to that rhetoric. No one's talking about that anymore, right? Now we have this conference and we bring on all these departments and they're literally, whether it's San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, D.C., Rosa, they're paying $20,000 bonuses. Now, Ray, had you ever heard of this in, in the NYPD, a $20,000 bonus to get someone? You know, maybe Nassau County would attract the cops from New York City to come, but they, but, and so, you know, Seattle starting salary, $80,000, San Francisco, $150,000, and yet they're having difficulty, which says to me, it isn't about the money. It's, it's about the nature of the position and the risk associated with it. But that's the period we're in now is, is cities are willing to fund. Why? Why? Because I do think at the end of the day, maybe um, this isn't fair, but people, you know, have uh, high confidence in their police. I mean, that's when the, when you do these surveys, you wouldn't get that impression seeing what you see, you know, sort of uh, visually. But at the end of the day, people, I think, much like like Rosa was saying, is they say, like, I know my local police, they do a good job. Now, that's not the that's not the case everywhere and certainly not. But even think about Minneapolis, where this all started. Where is the violent crime happening? It's happening on the north side in the fourth precinct. And where do people want most police in the fourth precinct? They just want good police, civilized police. But you take a place like Minneapolis, where they had 800 cops, now they have 500 cops. And who wants to be a Minneapolis cop? I mean, 
violence. But yet the people who live in that community who are most victimized, most murders, they want the police. So there's a kind of disconnect here in some ways that is hard to explain. I might just have a question for the for the four of you. Are we talking about things that are more easily understood by people in big cities uh, and, and that they all see some version of in big cities? Uh, and is it hard to communicate to people in rural areas of the country what, what a big city police challenge is like? If you look at homicide rates, some of the highest homicide rates are in places like Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas. They're higher than Philadelphia. They're higher than Chicago. Um, so the problems we're talking about are widespread, not mm -hmm. just in cities. The problem is getting the folks in those, in those rural areas to appreciate that in many ways, the problems are very similar. They're different in detail, for example, the opiate crisis, but the same basic issues adhere. And I don't know how you get that information across. The only thing I would add to that is I think this goes back to the point of policing is in some ways hyper-local. Uh, you know, that the the challenges, the problems, the the, the root causes of, of crime in, in rural Wyoming may be quite different. They may look quite different than the challenges in Washington, D.C., you know, southeast D.C. Um, in fact, I think if you ask somebody in northwest D.C., the wealthiest part of Washington, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about their perception, their encounters and experiences with police, they probably rarely see them. You know, they're not around very much. Those That's are right. relatively low crime areas, you know, to the extent that they see them, they're nice, polite people. If you ask somebody in a different part of the city, they'll say, oh, there's a police car on my on my block, if not two or three every single day. I constantly encounter police. You know, their, their experiences, both of crime and of police, not only varies from state to state, rural to urban, but can vary quite dramatically, often by class, you know, by income level in different neighborhoods within a single city. And, and that that's part of the challenge. You know, I the one other thing, just going back to something that Richard Burke said, we do know a lot now about the driver, about who commits violent crimes in cities. And it's typically a very, very small number of people no. are both the most frequently the victims and most frequently the perpetrators of violent crimes. You know, you've got sort of 95% of the communities just going about their lives, going to work, you know, taking care of their kids. And then you've got a very small percentage who are driving most of the violence. And to the extent that we can target interventions at that group of people, rather than painting that whole community with, oh, you people are just committing all these crimes, uh, th those are the those targeted interventions tend to be the most successful. Chuck? No, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. It's a small percentage of people who are responsible for a disproportionate number of crimes. And interesting, you know, the, the suspects and the victims look a lot alike. People wouldn't generally know that, but they've been both generally been arrested like eight or 10 times, not in all crimes, not all victims, but in many of those cases. So I think I'd go back to, you know, certain areas in certain cities, certain individuals, certain. So, you know, when we're talking about this policing, it's very targeted, but that's a small percentage of what the police do, but an important part. Uh, thanks to all of you, uh, Ray Kelly, Rosie Brooks, Richard Burke, Chuck Wexler, uh, for taking part in this in this panel. Also, many thanks to Joshua Plout, Roni Givigliano, and uh, Adrian Kiss from American Friends of Ravine Medical Center, uh, which produces Global Connections. And also thanks to our technical director, Bobby Grandone. Uh, our program sponsor, the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, is a 501c3 national charitable organization. Uh, it represents, in the United States, Israel's biggest hospital, Rabin Medical Center, in Petah Tikva, in Greater Tel Aviv. Uh, the website is www.afrmc.org. I'm Robert Siegel. This has been uh, Global Connections, Navigating the New Normal. I'll see you next month. Stay healthy and stay safe. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. 
Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.